17. This is what we call the last long discourse before Jesus endures what we have celebrated as a passion week. And he says, and he shares this with his disciples. And it's a very, you know, very intimate moment. And later on in chapter 17, for those of you guys who have read through the entire book of John, he prays for the disciples for himself as he faces the weight of the cross and the sin of the world, for his disciples, the 12 that are around him, and for the future believers, that is you and I here today. And so what we're going to do as we go through the I Am series and we wrap it up and we touch upon this final statement. And he starts off chapter 15 with it. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. What does this mean for you and I? As sure as we sit here in 2012, looking into December, Christmas is coming up. What does it mean for us to have a Christ, a Messiah, who says, I am the true vine. And it is a horticultural, it is a um, biological, if you will. It's an it's a analogy that has to do with gardening. And so not a lot of us garden, but for those of you who do, you kind of get this, but we're going to unpack it so that all of us begin to understand what it means to be grafted in to the true vine. And when Jesus says, I am the true vine, the implication is there are false vines out there. Other things that you seek after that promise you certain things, like nourishment, how you get fruit from your life, fruit that is everlasting. There are false vines out there, a good tree and a bad tree. And we know that Jesus teaches about the good tree and its fruit. Jesus teaches about the bad tree and its fruit. A true tree, if you will, and a false tree. So as we get into this passage today, we're gonna to look through some other passages in the Bible, and Jesus is teaching on what it means to bear fruit. So first of all, let's read through a portion of today's passage. So verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that he does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So we get this idea, there are two groups at the very beginning. Those who do not bear fruit, he takes away, and they're reserved for judgment, because branches that don't bear fruit, you cut them off. Anyone who's pruned the flowers, who's worked in an orchard, anybody who knows anything about vegetation and growing fruit, if it's not bearing fruit, it's hindering the rest of the things that are bearing fruit from bearing more fruit, so you cut it off. And you don't do anything with it, you throw it out, or you use it for fire, or you use it for something else. It's not useful for bearing fruit, so immediately we begin to understand that Christ is asking us for something here. I am the vine. My father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. God will divide. The chaff, the chaff from the weak heads that produce something. And we know these analogies because Jesus has been teaching them throughout the gospel. But every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. He's going to prune you. He's going to mold you. He's going to like take away a little bit of part of you so you grow more fruit. In other words, it's painful. Pruning is a very arduous process. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know where to prune. And you take away a little bit from that branch so that eventually it will grow more fruit. And so we begin to understand that when you are the branch that is being pruned to bear more fruit, this is not an easy process. In fact, you might be asking God, why are you taking things away from me right now? I thought you were blessing me. And of course, the answer later will be because you may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. Here's that statement again. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Hey, don't be mistaken here. Jesus is a loving God. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's compassionate, he's giving you everything you need to do to bear more fruit. But if you do not bear fruit, be also clear 
that you will be reserved, just as the branches are here, to be thrown in the fire and burned. The Bible is very clear on this doctrine. Very clear on this teaching. The goats in the lands, people who say, Lord, Lord, I knew you. And Jesus says, I don't know you. When did you ever come to feed the hungry, clothe the people in the prisons? When did you ever do these things for me? Very clear in Revelation. Those who are lukewarm, I will spit out of my mouth. And so we understand that this is a very clear teaching on the fruit that Christians are asked to bear in our lives. These fruit, they don't get us to heaven. That's a different idea altogether. Nothing will get us into heaven except for Jesus Christ. I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus makes that very clear. I am the gate. We know that He's the only way. But after we receive salvation, He calls us into a relationship where we abide in Him and He in us and we bear fruit. So if you're not bearing fruit, the implication is you've got to reflect on your salvation. Because something's got to show for the words that you profess. There's got to be some fruit in your life. And that is what Jesus is telling His disciples. Now there's a guarantee here as well because Jesus says, if you abide in Me, you will bear fruit as long as you abide in Christ. Okay? Christ will give you all the nourishment because He is divine and He will send all the nourishment to the branches so that they bear fruit. And eventually as you read down the passage you will bear much fruit to the glory of the Father and He will praise you and you will bring praise to Him. That's the way it works. This thing called discipleship. And so it calls for a moment of pause at the end 2012 to look back on 2012 from January to December 1st. How much fruit have you borne in your life? Is it fruit? Is it much fruit? Is it more fruit? Have you started withering away? Because at any one point, when you abide in Christ, that nourishment comes back to your spiritual life. Now, there's an interesting parable, a teaching, if you will, in uh, Mark chapter 11. So we're going to go to that. Now, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem in Mark. And there's this fig tree on the way. And this is such an interesting story because some people confuse what's going on here. So we're going to unpack this to help us understand what it means to bear fruit in our lives. So, on the following day when they came to, from Bethany, he was hungry. Jesus is a human. He's hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in a leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. In other words, there's a fig tree in the distance. It's got lots of leaves. And so Jesus goes to it expecting it to find figs. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves because it wasn't the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard it. And he's on his way to the temple, that little um, interlude there. He goes and cleanses the te um, temple. Okay? And he comes back. And as they pass by in the morning again, the same fig tree... They see that it's withered to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you curse has withered. And Jesus answered him, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, but does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And later on in today's passage, Jesus says the same thing. Whatever you ask for in my name, it will be given to you. Because the assumption is that you will abide in him. Now, when we read this parable here, it's kind of funny because we're like, how is it fair to the fig tree? Because we compare ourselves to the fig tree. Listen, it says it was not the season for figs. So if I'm going around in the middle of winter looking at orange trees in the orange orchards of you know, the Niagara region, it's all frozen over. I'm saying, oh, curse you trees. It's kind of like you're being unreasonable, aren't you? Because it's not the season for oranges. It's not the season for fruit. So how can you curse this fig tree, Jesus? Now let me teach you something about fig trees. I didn't know this before either. Whenever there are leaves on a fig tree, there is always fruit. Okay, that's the way fig trees grow. It's a sign that there's fruit on the fig tree. Now, it wasn't the season for figs in this um, episode here, but when the fig tree had um, leaves, the idea was that it was ahead of season. Okay? It's kind of like the kid who's so smart that gets bumped up a grade. 
They're ahead of their grade. They're ahead of the curve. They're ahead. This fig tree was ahead of the season. And so Jesus is like, whoa, what a great fig tree. It's got good soil. It's on the way. It's on public property. Let's go have some figs, guys. And when he goes there, he finds that it's misleading. There's no, no figs on it whatsoever. So it's kind of like the kid that gets bumped up a grade, and they know nothing about the grade that they were in before. So it was a misleading bump up, if you will. This is a misleading tree. And so it teaches us something here. How many of us in this room are figless fig trees, if you will? So many leaves, say the right thing, do all the right things, and it's misleading us to think that there's actually fruit in our lives. So many leaves covered up, so you kind of search in between, but there's absolutely nothing. These are the trees that are reserved and burned because they're completely useless. It looks good on the outside, but nothing, no fruit. You have to remember here, we're not teaching a salvation by works. Okay? Salvation is free. Christ died for us. We'll celebrate and remember that here today. What we're asking for is fruit in your lives to show that you are disciples, that you want to make a difference. And Christ asks us in today's passage to dwell and to abide and to remain in Him. And if we continue on, Jesus says in verse 7, If you abide in me and, in my, and my words abide in you, whatever you wish, it will be done for you. This is not wishful thinking. I want that red bike for Christmas or the galaxy phone or the school that I want to get into. Why aren't you giving it to me, God? According to God's will, when you ask for it, it will be given to you. According to His timing, if you ask for it, it will be given to you. God is not there to entertain you and to give you whatever you want. Jesus did not come to this earth to say these statements and then rule over the Roman Empire for that period of time. He came for something more. He came for salvation of his people. People wanted to make him the high priest. They wanted to take over the Roman government. John and James themselves, in the earlier in their life, they say, well, let me sit on your right hand, your left hand side. And the point of this, they miss the whole point. Jesus wasn't here to rule in that kind of authority. And Jesus asked them, listen, you're, you're going to be baptized with the same fire that I am? And James and John say, of course. And Jesus is like, you have no idea what you're talking about right now. Because he came for something else. And so when Christ says to so those of us here, abide in me, you have to understand that he's calling you to a level of commitment. He's asking you to stay with him, to stay the course. Because what does it mean to abide by the law of this country? It means that you obey it. It means you live within the parameters of the um, laws that the Canadian government sets for you or the, munici the municipality that you live in or the school that you go to, they have certain rules. You abide by those rules. You abide in Christ. You stay with Him. I've seen a lot of people stay with a variety of things. People abide in their friends. Hang out with them. They go out of their way. Even disobey their parents to hang out with them. I've seen people abide and their girlfriends and boyfriends, making them the center of their life. I've seen people abide in school and their studies because it means more to you for some reason. I've seen people abide in their electronics and their cell phones and their computers. I swear to you, I, I'm beginning to really believe this. If young people prayed as much as they spent on their electronic devices, I swear Jesus would come this December. And it would be the end. And consider the things that you abide in. People abide in their self-pity. People abide in their reputation. They abide in their good looks. You're committed to them. How many of us abide in Christ? How many of us want to bear the fruit that He asks us to bear? Kingdom work. Fruit of the Spirit. Saving souls. This is not about you anymore. Once you commit to Christ, it is, you have forsaken life to be about you. You no longer live, but Christ lives in you. This is a profession that Paul himself made. And Christ says, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. You see, God wants you to succeed in your spiritual life. If Satan doesn't, he distracts you. God wants you not only to bear fruit, 
not only to bear more fruit, but at the end, he wants you to bear much fruit and abundance of it, because he glorifies it, and it's good for you to prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And if you, could be, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Everything that Jesus teaches his disciples about bearing fruit, about having joy in your life, happens only if you abide in him. This is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friend. Jesus, in John 10, 11, as he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul uses the analogy of how a husband will love his wife the same way that Christ loved the church, laying down his life so that she may be made pure. This is how much God loves you. This is the kind of food, the kind of sustenance that God provides for you. This is the kind of abiding that God asks you to do in him so that you may have this life and have it in the abundance and to share that life with the people around you. In this context, as he speaks to his disciples, the idea of bearing fruit is direct directly related to saving souls. And every single one of those disciples, except for Judas, who betrayed him, goes on to die for the church, to die for their Lord. And in their death, so much fruit is born. And the early church thrives under persecution because of their fearlessness and boldness and courage, because they began to understand Christ's mission on this earth and what it means to abide in him. And they found the strength and the courage in their abiding in Christ to give up their lives. We're so scared to give up our time. We're so scared to give up our dreams. We're so scared to reach out of our little comfort boxes. But that is where Christ is calling you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. In the same way, Jesus always, did you notice this about Christ? Whenever he does something, or asks his disciples to do something, I should say, he always does it first. Okay? I am the good shepherd. Listen, I'm going to show you how to love one another. Take off your shoes, your sandals. I'm going to wash your feet. This is how I want you to serve one another. Greater love has no, nothing more than laying down a, a friend laying down their life for another. I will show you what that looks like, and you follow me. Did you ever notice that about Christ? He paves the way for you and I. He provides everything that you and I need to live a spiritual life of abundance. So the question isn't, why isn't God providing for me in order for me to produce spiritual food? The question is, are you actually abiding in Christ? How many hours a day, you don't have to put up your hands, you don't have to answer this. It's a rhetorical question. How many hours a day do you spend on the computer? I'm not talking about homework time. How many hours a day do you spend in things that actually don't matter in eternity? Things that actually draw your attention on things that need to be done, you know, like schoolwork, um, or house chores, whatever. But how much do you, of your time in the 24 hours do you spend abiding in Christ? Because that will directly correlate to the amount of fruit that you bear. Because Christ makes a promise. And he makes good on his promises. When Christ says, abide in me, he's asking you to stay with him. He's asking you to stay the course, to come talk with him, sit down, okay? Have a meal with me. Join me in this life. Let's live life together. Those of you guys who have done evangelism, evangelism explosion know what Revelation 3.20 says. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens his door that I'm knocking on, I'm going to come in. And I'm going to eat with them. He's going to eat with me. And we're going to abide together. He's going to abide in me, in my presence, in my love, in my grace, in my vision. And I will abide in you. So put down Whatever it is that is distracting you. Put down your phones. I can see every single one of you who are fooling around. Believe me, it's a very good view from up here. Put down whatever it is in your hearts that distracts you. Put down your idols. I was just sharing with a brother of yours and mine. 
when Justin Bieber came into town, he was floored at how much the people just praised and accoladed this kid. Like it's weird, and it's funny in one sense, but it's also ridiculous in another. And Christ calls you to see things the way that he does. And he says, I don't want you to be the branches that are turned away into the fire. I want you to be the branch that bears much fruit. I want you to be the liquid that bears much fruit. I want you to be the family that bears much fruit. I want you to be the ministry. I want you to be the church that bears much fruit for God's kingdom to his glory and to yours. This is the way that God works. And that abiding in Christ gives us that kind of strength to lay down our lives for those around us, for his church, for people who have yet to know him. <laughs> that is how our people got the gospel message. Those of you guys who are going to confirmation class, I'm going to this very briefly. Korean Christianity is very short. Just around 200 years. How do you think we got it? Those missionaries who came to lay down their lives for what matter to them and what gives us salvation here today. So think about it. What are you living for? What are you abiding in? What takes up most of your time? Because it could be yourself. It could be your worries. It could be other people. These aren't necessarily evil, but they become sin for you if it takes place in Christ in your life. So pay attention to the days that go by, especially, again, as we look into 2013. Those of you guys who came into Friday Night Bible Study, we laid down this challenge for you. Well, we kind of uncreatively coined the December challenge. I couldn't think of a better way to put it. For the month of December, pray more. The first thing that you do when you get up. The first thing that you do before you write a test. Right before you go to bed, the last thing that you do in the day, pray and see if God is not faithful. For 31 days, okay, 30 because today's the second. 30 days in December, see if he does not bless you. Turn off the computer a little bit earlier. Max, like, put a limit to the time that you have there. Pick up the Bible and read it and see if he's not faithful. See if he does not cause you to bear more fruit. Because this, again, is a promise that God gives us. This is not me. This is directly Christ talking to his disciples. Too many young people waste their lives. You abide in all sorts of interesting things. Again, not evil in and of itself, but they, they that become sins when they get in the way of you and Jesus. Christ also says, you are my friends. If you do what I command. Do you know who the friends of the book of God were in the Bible? There were people like Abraham. There were people like Joseph and Daniel and Esther. The friends of God, if you will. And you and I have that same title, if we do what he commands. No longer do I call you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. So all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Christ is choosing you as he stands at the brink of all our lives and he keeps on knocking, asking for you to open the door and let him come in and not just shout things through a window. I have appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whenever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is the command that Christ gives us in his last I am statement. And he goes through all the things in the Gospel of John. Actually, John chooses certain teachings because it shows us something about the divinity of Christ. And this last statement to his disciples, before all that chaos of the passion begins, abide, abide in me. J.C. Ryle once put it this way. To abide in Christ means to keep up a habit of constant close communion with Him. To be always leaning on Him, resting on Him, pouring out our hearts to Him and using Him as our fountain of life and strength, as our chief companion and best friend. To have His words abiding in us is to keep His sayings and precepts continually before our memories and our minds and to make them the guide of our actions and the rule of our daily conduct and behavior. This is what it means to abide. If you do not know the Word of God, there is no way you're going to be able to know how to abide. Pick up the Bible and read it. Talk to Him. Pray. There's no other way that you're going to grow deeper in Christ. And then with another Bible passage in Matthew, chapter 21, verse 43, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing 
its fruit. The Bible has a lot of these analogies about fruit. I want you to be a child of God who produces much fruit, who bears much fruit. I want us to be a ministry that bears much fruit. I want this to be a church that bears much fruit to the glory of God. And I will leave you with this one thought. When Christ asks us to abide in Him, to abide in him it is a call for commitment. Chuck Swindoll said, more than once, Jesus deliberately addressed certain issues that quickly diminished the number of onlookers. It was commitment that thinned the ranks. Everyone loves to listen to him. They're all in the crowd. But once Jesus says, follow me, people are like, wait, not right now. I've got to go do something. And you've got to evaluate whether that's your attitude right now. After I do this, after I do that, do you know what? After I call my friend, after I achieve this in my life, stop. Because that cycle will never end. These I am statements are not just cool sayings that Jesus says to get people to listen up. The revelations of who he is in your life and who we ought to be as your personal Lord and Savior. So, as we wrap up this series, and as we go into our Christmas series, Pastor Sarah next week will preach upon the shepherds as they come to adore Christ in Bethlehem. I want you to prepare your hearts for the season of celebration. It's not about presents. It's not about family gatherings. It is about Christ. No matter how commercial it has gotten these days, it is about Christ. And you need to hide that in your heart. So I hope, as Christ calls us to believe, as he calls us to commit, that in our commitment we will learn to abide in him. And that each and every single one of us will bear much fruit in our lives. And that will be evidence of God's goodness. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we pray, Lord, that you would teach us what it means to abide in you. That when we turn away, that you would beckon us up and beckon us into a deeper faith, into a deeper calling. Father, as we prepare our hearts to receive the communion service, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, who laid his life down for us as the good shepherd, as the great friend, as the as the great teacher, as our Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that you bless the students here, that they might receive salvation, they might be a people that bears much fruit. They will learn what it means to discern between distraction and things that will take their attention away from you. They will learn what it means to pray on their knees and petition for the things that are according to your will. Father, would you raise this generation to be powerful, to be bearers of fruit, to be the light of the world. Thank you, Lord, for all these things.